According to scientists, people are causing climate change, which is causing the drought and heat waves, waves, and these are making violent conflicts worse, including here, but also in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, elsewhere. From a religious perspective, this isn't a crisis of nature, this is a crisis of the human being. And we are here today to hear from three esteemed religious figures who can help to move humanity, starting with Jerusalem, toward a more sustainable planet. So I'm just going to introduce each speaker briefly. Uh, Tadi Zahalka is judge of the Muslim Sharia Court of the State of Israel in Jerusalem. He's an accomplished judge, lecturer, author, and activist. And he has filled several important positions in the Sharia Court system, including that of director as well as published two books. Rabbi David Rosen is the International Director of Interreligious Affairs at AJC, the American Jewish Committee. He's the former Chief Rabbi of Ireland and was also the rabbi uh, of the largest congregation in South Africa, in Cape Town. And he is uh, very active in interfaith collaboration on environmental issues as well as on uh, interfaith issues in general. Father Francesco Paton is, Paton is custos of the Holy Land. <clears throat> the custody of the Holy Land is a custodian priory of the Franciscan order in Jerusalem, founded as province of the Holy Land in the year 1217 by Saint Francis of Assisi, who also founded the Franciscan order. He served in various capacities in his province and also within the order. So thank you all for coming. And I'd like to start out by asking, can you please share a teaching from your faith tradition that relates to addressing climate change and a more sustainable planet? Maybe uh, Custos, uh, Father Paton, you could start. Uh, yes, uh, recently uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, wrote uh, the encyclical letter, Laudato Si, praise be to you, O Lord. And I think that uh, in the recent years, this uh, is uh, the most important uh, uh, statement also on the climate change. Uh, in the encyclical, uh, Pope Francis uh, speaks uh, of the climate changes uh, from different perspectives because uh, he knows the biblical, uh, perspective, uh, he knows also the scientific perspective uh, and uh, at the same time uh, the common experience. We experience that uh, something is changing in the climate when we are uh, more than 50 years old, we understand how uh, many changes uh, there were in this past uh, 50 years. and. Uh, in this issue, particularly, uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, links uh, the problem of uh, climate change with the problem of a uh, uh, new way of uh, finding energy and uh, with the issue of water. These two issues are very important, I think, uh, uh, in uh, the life of today. and. Uh, very important for every, everybody of us. Uh, from the Christian and Franciscan perspective, uh, we are thinking that uh, we are part of the creation and so uh, we have to take care of our common home and that we have to take care, as St. Francis said, of our uh, brothers and sisters, all the creatures, and uh, of uh, our sister and mother, who is the earth. Thank you. Hi, Rosa. Well, I would go back to the injunction in the Torah, uh, in the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. Vacharta b'chayim, l'ma t'chiyata v'zarecha. Choose life in order that you and your children shall live. Today, this is a matter of life and death. And in 
many respects, everything else becomes very, very secondary in our world because if we don't have a home in which to live, then all the rest is, as you've heard me say so many times, moving the deck chairs on the Titanic as we advance towards the iceberg. So, first and foremost, it's the choice for life. And this is the imperative existential choice that we face, whether we're going to allow a world to exist for future generations or not, as well as in terms of what kind of world we live in. And that connects, if I may, with another very famous Midrash, Midrash in Vaikra Rabba, which talks of people in a boat. And one starts making a hole under his seat, and the other say, what are you doing? He says, none of your business. It's under my seat. I'm making my hole. But they say, but we will all drown. Never has that been more evident than our world today. Today, nobody can live isolated in a village and say it's none of their business. We are all inextricably bound up with one another, as we always were, but today it's more evident than ever before. And if we don't care about it in one place, then ultimately it will come back to haunt us in another. So this is an existential challenge for us. If we are moral, ethical human beings, especially if we are people of faith, there is no option but to make it a major focus of our activity. Okay. The religion of Islam asked and ordered human beings to be responsible <coughs> of all the earth. And we have several verses in the Quran that gives the responsibility for everything on the earth, on the human being, and the human should take care of everything for the coming generation. We have, first of all, the verses in the Quran. Allah says, the Lord <coughs> said to the angels, I will create vice grant on the earth. It means that the human being, he replaced the God on the earth, and he should control everything in the earth. And then in other verses, Allah says that we did indeed offer the trust to the heavens and to the earth and to the mountains, but they refused to undertake it being af afraid, there, uh, there, uh, therefore, but man undertook it. He was indeed unjust and foolish. Few more verses. Means the trust, the responsibility given to the human beings in order to take care of everything on the earth, but it is a heavy trust. And the man is, was a foolish when he took this responsibility because it is very, very, hard to take care of everything. We, we now see what's going on the earth, about the uh, uh, global warming, about the, uh, the climate, about everything. It is a, a, a heavy responsibility. And then in other verses, Allah says in the Quran, we have honored sons of Adam, provided them with the, tra the, the, the transport on land and sea, giving them for sustenance things good and pure and conferred on them special favors above great part of our creation. It means Allah gives the, the human beings to be above all the other creations, but this status is give them the, uh, the responsibilities. So what we are doing on our earth, it is just because of our actions, just because of our behavior as a human beings. It doesn't connect with Allah because Allah and the Lord give us this responsibility and ask us to take care of it. And while we don't do that, we broke and we miss uh, 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 take care of this responsibility. And I think this is not just because Allah wants us to take care of his creation, but in order to keep it for the other generation who will come after us and they need all these resources of the earth in order to have life. So this verse is very, very important, and I think we, as Muslims, we should take part in keeping and, and taking care of our uh, earth, our environment, and, and be a productive part in, in saving and preserving the, the, the nature and, and the, 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 uh, all the earth. Thank you. It's an interesting commonality between uh, Islam and, and Judaism, uh, this issue of responsibility uh, that's in uh, the book of Genesis, the famous story of Cain and Abel, of where uh, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? 
Well, the, the answer to that question is yes. We are responsible, and Rabbi Soloveitchik taught, I am, therefore I am responsible. That we need to take responsibility for our actions and for what happens uh, to, to others as a result of our actions. That's the Christian Bible too. And the Christian yes. Bible, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So can you say from a personal level, why are you personally con concerned about climate change? Because I think that uh, the climate change uh, is something that uh, uh, touches our life. For example, I am a son of a small farmer and uh, we have a small vineyard. When uh, I was a child, uh, I remember that uh, we were uh, harvesting uh, uh, at the end of September and sometimes at the end of October. In the last uh, 10 years, uh, we are always harvesting uh, in August. And so this means that something changed. Uh, we are experiencing a uh, season of uh, strange summers, uh, very hot uh, and uh, with uh, storms uh, that uh, in my region, I am from the north of Italy, we never experience it. But uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, you were saying the same for uh, uh, here in Israel. And so it is a personal experience, not only a theory, the climate change. And uh, when I think that uh, this can in some way affect my region, I think that uh, it can affect more and more other regions in which uh, the, the climate is uh, at this moment in uh, a very uh, point of uh, not coming back. And uh, for this reason, I think that uh, it is very important uh, the responsibility for the creation, but it is very important also the responsibility for people. And uh, I find uh, uh, very interesting uh, that uh, uh, Pope Francis uh, in the encyclical, when uh, addresses the issue of the climate uh, change, uh, tells that uh, in our days there are not only refugees because of wars in the world, but there are refugees because of climate change. When uh, uh, great regions uh, uh, are going into desert, people is not able to live. And uh, this is a source of uh, migration. And uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, refugees because of climate changes. And so I think that uh, uh, it is something that uh, touches uh, uh, in a very personal way, but uh, at the same time it is a uh, something that it is related with uh, uh, social, political, scientific levels. Everything is interrelated in our uh, creation. I don't think I can do any better. And I think also uh, my, my comments more or less at the beginning related to this. I, I don't understand how a person of any kind of ethical responsibility let alone a person of faith, cannot be engaged in this issue. This is the supreme challenge of our time. Uh, if we do not engage in it, it means that not only are we showing a lack of disregard and care for our cosmos, but exactly as Father Patron has been mentioning, it shows a lack of regard for our fellow human beings. It shows a lack of regard for our children, for our grandchildren. What kind of parents or grandparents are we if we're not concerned about what kind of world we provide for tomorrow? It's the ultimate religious imperative of our time. I think that we, uh, it, this is a sign from the God, the changing of the climate. Because when we fight one against the other in order to, uh, uh, for the land and for, for money and for, for uh, this uh, uh, will of the people, and we forget the basics of our life, which is the, the which is, the, the, uh, how to live in welfare 
everyone, for everyone. Then when we will we uh, we will uh, be be on time that the land doesn't mean anything because the land it is a desert, it is a, 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 a in, in bad situation, and every, all the people are escaping from the, from the land to other lands where they will find water and will, where, where they will find green place and, and where, where they will find food and uh, to, to eat. So this is a sign that we should be back on our mind. How to think about issues, how to think about all the, all the important issues that we think it is important, but it's, in fact it is not because our life is more important than any other thing. To, to, to stay on, on, on life and to keep the life of people and to give people the opportunity to live their life in welfare, in security, it is more important than that peace and other peace of anything. So this is a sign and it should or, uh, give us the opportunity to rethink about all the issues to think how to leave these uh, 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 conflicts about uh, uh, something which is not important really for our life and to uh, focus and to invest in the important issues, which is the life. Thank you. So, I think it's you mentioned, Rabbi Rosen, about uh, relating to one's children and grandchildren. And the, the past month, uh, for everyone who's been here, has been very hot, and essentially consistently hot. Uh, and my, my son uh, woke up in the middle of the night, and he said to me, Abba, why is it so hot here? So for me to be in integrity with my children, I need to take responsibility for their future. So why is it important for people of many faiths to come together to address climate change and not just each individual community works on it on their own? Who are you asking first? Uh, do, you, do you want to start? Right. Well, um, I think in a way it's paradigmatic of the whole issue. What climate change and our environmental crisis shows, as I indicated in my initial comments, is how interrelated, interdependent, inextricably tied up we are with one another. And therefore the idea that anybody can go it alone is a ridiculous illusion in our times. It was always a ridiculous illusion, but it's even more ridiculous in our times. And therefore, upon people who understand the moral challenge of the situation we are in, it is, should be obvious that we have to be the greater greater than the sum of our different parts and work with all constructive forces. And especially, therefore, if you are a people of faith and of religious commitment, this must mean working together. To begin with, anybody who thinks that they can live in isolation of one another is deluding themselves. I would also say it's a heresy because to some extent you're shutting yourself off from the broader perspectives of the divine in the world. And therefore, interreligious engagement for me is not only a matter of protecting the interests of your community and fighting prejudice and bigotry and areas of common action. It is actually an engagement, the discovery of the divine beyond your own particular tradition. No one tradition can encapsulate the totality of the divine. If I didn't dislike the word, I would say that's a heresy because you're trying, as it were, to encapsulate the divine and say you know everything there is to know about God, etc. Which is, of course, quite ridiculous. So any kind of interreligious engagement actually is a, is a growth for the person who is genuinely engaged. It also enables you, gives you the opportunity to deepen your own understanding of your own particular tradition, and I would say strengthens your own particular commitment. But in the area that we face today, this most existential of all existentialist challenges of our time, the obligation to work together with other religious communities is greater than ever before. And this is both us as a reflection of our sense of commitment to one another, nothing perhaps demonstrates that more than interreligious cooperation, as well as a recognition that we are all part of this global village, and together with understanding that we have a responsibility to work together for the benefit of humankind at whole, uh, as a whole. If we don't engage in interreligious cooperation, it is 
to that aniot, how would you say that in English? It is, there's no, there's no, in the literal translation of the Hebrew phrase would be a certificate of poverty. It means you're reflecting your own impoverishment in terms of your own mind and your own vision. It shows a limited, narrow mind, an insularity, a lack of expansion. Within our community, and especially within the Jewish community, we know that well. We know that because of centuries of negative historical experiences, as well as a conflict that we live in, it leads people very often to be insular, inward-looking, and narrow-minded. But ultimately, that's totally counterproductive. It's not good for us, it's not good for our country, it's not good for our society, it's not good for the world. Interreligious cooperation, especially around key central issues, and this is the most central issue of our times, is ultimately good for us and good for our world, and the only way we will make it good for us and good for our world. Yes, I think that uh, it is very important uh, the cooperation between the different religions on these issues. First of all, because we are human beings. Uh, in uh, all our traditions, we recognize that uh, we did not make ourselves. We received the gift of life and uh, we received the gift uh, of uh, creation. And uh, in this experience of human being, uh, we have a common uh, sensibility. And uh, we can uh, also uh, improve this common sensibility. And so we can cooperate for something that it is important for every human being in the present and in the future. At the same time, we uh, have, uh, in this way, the opportunity to uh, improve uh, a kind of dialogue <coughs> between us that is very important, not only for this issue, but maybe this issue uh, could be <coughs> the way uh, through which we can uh, then uh, afford uh, other issues. And so, when uh, uh, a way of dialogue is open, when uh, a confidence between us uh, uh, has uh, uh, given, we can, after, uh, I think, uh, talk about other issues uh, important uh, on social level and uh, also on political and religious level. But uh, first of all, for me, it is because we are all human beings and we are not over the creation. We are part of the creation. But uh, we have a responsibility toward the creation, toward this generation and toward the future generations. And uh, it is not uh, only a personal responsibility, it is a shared responsibility. Look, in the Quran, we have a verses, a clear, a clear verses, <coughs> that Allah ordered the Prophet Muhammad sallam, to call all the people of the holy books to come to one common world, to serve the one God, and to do all the things that is, it is in the benefit of all the humanity. So, we, it is an order in the Quran that we must work together in order to pray, to worship the one God, and to do all we can in order to improve our life, in order to achieve the goals of the creation and to have a, 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 a pleased life for everyone. So this is, uh, th this, mean, this meaning of the verses for me and for, for all the people should encourage us to be engaged in an open dialogue and all the issues that it is in, in common interest of all of us, especially cases of uh, climate and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and nature, because it, is, it, it could hurt all of us. It is the basic of our life. So I think that it is not uh, uh, something that I can do. It is something that I must do in this interfaith dialogue, this open dialogue. And I think that we should take out of the room, out of the dialogue, all the issues that it is in conflict between us. 
there are people who their job is to solve that problems. But there are other problems, other cases, that it is, a, a, it, it, it is in, 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 in common interest of all of us, and all of us need the solution of that cases, so we should work together in order to solve it by, by this uh, 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 joint forces of all the people from the different uh, 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 religions, different nations, different places. We have uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, he was he asked by the people, uh, would you join a, 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 the work or the, the aliens uh, that was done in Jahiliya before the Islam in order to keep the, the, uh, the values of the, the, the community? He said, yes, I will do it with the infidels even if we have Islam now, but it is because uh, it achieves the benefit of all the people. So does it mind uh, uh, if, if there is Islam or no Islam, if there are uh, Muslims or Christians or Jews or other religions, it, it, the importance is to join forces in order to defeat any, any, anything who threat our life. Shukran. So I want to ask one last question, and then I want to open it to the everyone else here, if you have questions. My, my last question is actually a little bit uh, uh, more of a difficult question, which is, it, from a certain perspective, the environmental crisis is not a crisis of nature, it's a crisis of religion, in the sense that religions are the biggest NGOs in the world. They have, they educate billions of people. 85% of the people in the world identify with a religion. They have huge media networks, huge land holdings, huge financial resources. And yet, at the same time, the, uh, the, the training schools, the seminaries in our three religions are not adequately equipping the next generation of religious leadership to teach about a religious sustainable lifestyle. Just one anecdote, I, I was meeting with a seminary dean and he said to me, look, our formation program is eight years. And we are teaching uh, Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek and Latin and systematic theology and practical theology and constructive theology, etc. It, it doesn't even matter what religion he's from because there's a similar story among in our three faiths as well as in other faiths. And he said to me, I, I realize that environmental sustainability is an important issue, but what do you suggest that I take out of the curriculum in order to include some education on this topic? And so my question to you is, what can be done to motivate seminaries and, and clergy today to teach more on this issue? I think that it is, should come from the leaders of the community. The, the, for me, the, the leaders of the Muslim community in Israel, outside of Israel, they should encourage, they should motivate the, the, the educators in, in the universities, in the seminaries, in the schools, even in the, in the elementary schools. We should educate our children from, the, from their beginning of the life that the, uh, the uh, climate and the, 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 the environment and the nature, it is part of our life. And in, and in order to continue living in this earth, we should take care of it. And, and when, when, when the, the leaders, they put this issue on the first, on the beginning of any a curriculum of, of, of studies, in any level of studies, then the people will understand it. But while we still, still uh, thinking about political issues, about conflicts, about uh, 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 how to, to, uh, 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 to encourage uh, hates, crime, crime of hates, or, or how we can, uh, 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 can in, in, uh, uh, support terror, any kind of terror, not, not um, only military terror. Sometimes uh, uh, words are killing more than a weapon, weapons. So 
the, the, the uh, leaders of any religion, they should start thinking again about any curriculum that they should uh, put for any study, and, and they even in the even in the speech in the mosque or in the, the church or in the synagogue or everywhere, we should explain for our people what is the importance of this issue. And and it is our responsibility. And I think if we ask any one of the leaders to take this responsibility seriously and start working on it, I think that the people will follow us and will change and will give this issue the importance that uh, it deserves. Uh, I'm not one to be dismissive about education, but I'm not sure that education in a profound way that I think you are suggesting is necessarily the, the solution. Of course, people need to understand what the consequences of the abuse of our environment are. But people need to understand, for example, um, uh, one of the great success stories of modern times is the degree to which we've successfully stigmatized smoking tobacco. So today, people who smoke feel like pariahs, and that's probably good. And that protects our society more. Now, it wasn't like that 50 years ago, even less than that. And this required a big change. The change did not come about because people understood the physical pr process that takes place within us as a result of tobacco smoking. They eventually understood it was unhealthy, and you didn't need more than that in order to be able to get the message across when there is enough of a groundswell. Um, so I think there are two things. First of all, I think it's a little bit disingenuous to suggest that seminaries that have a particular focus for a kind of formation are going to cover the gamut of human needs. They don't offer basic education on health. They don't offer basic education on economics. They don't offer even basic education in terms of social norms and, and uh, various ways to function in society. They have a narrow focus. And they're not likely to break significantly through that. There are some institutions who might, which, but there'll be exceptions to the rule. They won't be the majority. Um, the important thing is to be able to get exemplars of correct behavior. And here comes a second thing. A seminary and even religious leaders are not going to change the situation with regards to climate change. The critical bodies that have to make those changes are governments and multinationals, and we've got to be able to get that across. But just as with smoking, if there is enough religious leadership as well as civil society leadership, and people in general area, even in the entertainment industry, who understand the issues and create a greater public awareness, it's possible eventually to influence uh, governments and multinationals, and I think religions have a, an important role there. But I think the important role for religious figures, whether they are mm, imams or priests or rabbis in congregations or whether they are within particular institution, etc., is to be exemplars. And that's where we've got to demand more. And that's where we've got to use the argument from our tradition to show that and if you want to argue, especially for people within traditional, more conservative with a small c structures, you've got to argue according to their codes. You've got to argue to the Muslim leadership according to Sharia. You have to argue certainly to orthodox leadership according to principles of halakha. You have to be able to show what's doing is contrary to the teachings that they espouse. And if you can therefore give people, a, if, and therefore, what's really important, and also Pope Francis says, if you'll excuse me borrowing from your, uh, <laughs> has, has also spoken about it, and this, I think, is where we need very much to go, is to um, address the challenge of a culture of waste. We are a wasteful culture. We buy things and we put them aside and things instead, and that's not only recycling, but just in terms of a lack of modesty within our society. Now, those values, in terms of not to waste, are fundamental to our religion. In Judaism, it's a principle of Baal Tashchit. It's a sacred principle, not to waste. I was grown up 
I was raised never to uh, leave uh, my plate empty unless I really didn't feel well. Certainly not to waste food, and if there was food, they're not being used to share it with animals in different ways, etc. And we've lost that sense. We've become a selfish, self-indulgent, wasteful society. Now, it's important to get that message to our religious leaders, and that kind of message needs to be inculcated, where the people see exemplars behaving in a manner that is modest, that is not wasteful, that is not profligate, then they will take those examples. And we need simply to raise a greater awareness in our communities of that challenge of our times, which often people are not aware of. But I think if we focus on that rather than trying to educate them about the global ramifications and mechanisms of climate change, we will probably have more success. Yes, in the encyclical letter, Pope Francis uh, talks on uh, uh, ecological conversion and ecological conversion is part of this uh, uh, way of thinking uh, we have to change ourselves we are not able to change the others but we can change ourselves and from ourselves can uh, came an example this is true we have to change ourselves uh, reflecting what is good and what is wrong in our way of life. And uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, underlines many times uh, the problem of the uh, throw throwaway culture, the culture of waste. And uh, he says that uh, in the culture of waste, uh, not only the things are thrown away, but even people. And so this is a mentality. And uh, this mentality is basically uh, caused by the consumeristic uh, way of life, way of thinking, society. And so uh, we have, I think, to reflect on this issue of uh, uh, ecological conversion and uh, at the same time uh, I think that uh, it is important uh, uh, that when we have uh, the possibility and the opportunity also to educate for example as custody of the Holy Land uh, we are uh, managing uh, 15 schools and uh, I think that it is very important that in our school we introduce uh, some program of uh, uh, ecological education. And uh, in a very simple way, what uh, uh, Pope Francis calls the everyday life uh, ecology. So it is very important uh, to teach uh, uh, to avoid uh, the culture of waste. It is important to teach the culture of take care of the objects. Uh, to clean uh, the rooms, uh, to get off the light, uh, uh, to preserve uh, the water because it is precious, and many, many, many other, to respect uh, a tree, uh, and so uh, to reuse what we can reuse, to recycle what we can recycle. Uh, I understand that uh, on other level, that is the public uh, uh, level and the uh, political level, uh, good practices should be incentivated and bad practices should be uh, disincentivated. For example, I come from and coming from a, a region uh, in the north of Italy, and uh, in in, uh, in my region we recycle, we differentiate more than 80 percent of our waste but uh, it is important for this that uh, if you don't do this practice you are not uh, uh, encouraged so uh, your taxation is higher if you don't uh, differentiate uh, your waste so this is the way in which the public uh, administration
can manage. We can manage in other way uh, through the educational system when we have this opportunity uh, and to the personal conversion and uh, example uh, for everybody. Thank you. I just want to briefly mention that uh, we're also announcing the release of a new letter uh, endorsed by 36 uh, Orthodox Israeli rabbis uh, calling for action on climate change and uh, in agreeing with the consensus in climate science. That's something that Dr. Richard Schwartz has been instrumental in organizing. And uh, so anyone who wants to talk about that, uh, feel free to, to speak with him about it. And I'd like to open it up. I've been very enlightened uh, and uh, very happy to be hearing uh, what's going on on the blue coast of Spain with the fishers, fishermen. Uh, they've been plagued over the years by uh, all of the plastic garbage in the area and the sea. And uh, they've had to try and contend with this problem. And now a, um, some sort of an activity has been um, arranged that they can collect in their nets all of the garbage, uh, plastic garbage that they find, and bring it in at the end of the day to some factories that turn it into um, fabric uh, for the uh, fabric and fashion industry. And all of that stuff is being used. I did want to ask a question from the Father. In, has, has the Franciscan um, order made any attempts to uh, reach um, other Catholic uh, schools? Uh, to uh, introduce uh, programs and your philosophy of ecology? Uh, all around the world, uh, I don't know the situation. Here in the Holy Land, uh, we are trying to start a program of uh, uh, ecological education. I met uh, the responsible uh, uh, of our commission for justice, uh, peace and uh, care of the creation and we had a talk uh, on this issue and we want to start uh, this year uh, because I noticed that uh, it is a very important uh, issue here. And uh, I think that uh, we can also contact uh, other schools, but uh, I think that uh, it is important uh, in this uh, field also to give an example. And so, when someone uh, begins uh, other fall. You know, can I ask a question? I'd like to ask uh, Rabbi Roseanne, there are two verses in the Torah, one of them is in Parashat Vahayai Shamoa, where it shows that as a result of your sins there will not be rain, and also in Parashat where it says and your soil will be copper and your sky will be iron. Uh, do you think that uh, as Iyad, uh, Kadi Iyad said, what's happening is because of our sins? Well, um one needs, obviously, the language, uh, as Maimonides says, as Maimonides says, the Torah uses language that everybody can understand. And therefore, for somebody, the language of it's because of your sins resonates with them. With others, it might not, and you may need, therefore, have to use a more abstract description of processes. But there, what sin essentially means, at least from a, I would say, a biblical perspective, is there are consequences to your actions. Uh, I mean, Western culture, I mean... Uh, I understand what you mean. Therefore, I'm saying, uh, first of all, want to rephrase simply your question so I can answer it in a manner that I believe can resonate with everybody. So, first of all, I want to, sin is essentially consequences of our actions. In the language of the Mishnah, the, the wages of sin is sin, and the blessing of righteousness is righteousness. In other words, there are consequences to our action. That's the concept of reward and punishment. And Maimonides understand those passages which you're referring to as therefore indicating the concept of reward and punishment. For him, the language of you will get your rage in your seasons or you will know well, there will be con negative consequences in your seasons is a metaphor. 
But today, precisely as you are saying, we can see now those passages far more literally than in the past. And we can see that, in fact, if we do not behave morally in a sense of moral responsibility, which is the essential teaching, therefore, of the Torah, and therefore of all religious revelation, that we are not in this world simply to be able to pursue our own egocentric interests, but we are part of a larger community, part of a cosmos, and we have to live in the, as the instruction to Abraham and his seed with righteousness uh, and justice. And this is the way we have to lead our lives. If we fail to do so, there are consequences. So a lot of our environmental degradation today is a result of our, of our egocentricity, of people, of businesses, of industries, not caring about what the consequences of our effluence and allowing the pollution of whole-scale areas and of, of, uh, of, of water resources, etc. That's the result of our moral failure. Is that sin? Yes. Is that punishment? Yes, because it's a consequence of our action. And therefore we are punished in the sense that we draw upon ourselves the consequences of our negative actions. And today we can see it in a far more visible, dramatic way than ever before. Of course, I'm not suggesting that every consequence of our environment is a result of immoral conduct. There are things which are simply the result of our ignorance, things we didn't know about, things we need therefore to educate and to improve. But a lot of it comes from human avarice. And human avarice will not be restrained purely through voluntary action. We need the necessary systems, and that's what we need governments for, in order to be able to protect society and take the necessary legislation. It's very interesting that you're saying that all of your religious leaders have a responsibility to educate your, you know, your followers, for want of a better word, and I think that is true. But the example of smoking that the rabbi gave, I think, is very interesting because it actually took a long time to happen. And although this education saying, you know, it's dirty, it's bad for your health, it's this, it's that, it did have an effect. The fact of the matter is, it was only when government took steps and said, you can't smoke inside restaurants, you can't do this, you can't do that, and continually raised the price that it actually happened. And someone mentioned, I, I, think, I think you mentioned that there, there's certain steps that governments are taking in places like Sweden with regard to how you do your recycling. It's so draconian, it's so strict, that you have to comply. Even when <coughs> I was visiting England, I've been living in Argentina where there isn't really any regulation, and of course there are lovely people trying to say, let's not, you know, let's, let's try and be um, eco-friendly. But the fact of the matter is people are lazy by nature. And if someone isn't going to stop you, then unless you're, you know, you've got the high moral ground, unfortunately, for the majority of people, if they can get away with things, like mixing their waste, they'll just do it. I, to express perhaps a word of disagreement with my, with my teacher, Rabbi Rosen, that, you know, the majority, if we look, for example, at the U.S. withdrawal from the climate agreement, and why, you know, because the U.S. is the second biggest community, the largest historical polluter of CO2, how could it be that they're not involved in the climate agreement? Well, the majority of religious Americans voted for a president who denies climate change. And so, and the, how could that be? Well, part of it is because most clergy in America don't speak about climate change in their teaching or preaching. Okay? And so, and how could that be? Well, that goes back to what I was saying about the seminary education, that, that they don't learn about this. And so that I think that there is a chain that leads to governments not taking action in, in relation to... But then the problem issue. is in the schools, even in the primary schools, long before you get to seminaries. And that's where one can do much more in terms of also getting uh, institutions and governments and uh, regional authorities to be able to enlist in. That's far more consequential than working on seminaries. <coughs> but yeah. I, would add, uh, I would like to add that government comes to reflect the interests of the, the public. When the public changes mind and cases of, of environment, cases of, of nature and climate, it is something which is important for him, and they would like to put it in the in the, in the top of, of the issues that any government should take care of or any parliament should take care of it. So the the, politi the political uh, 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 groups or, or uh, parties they really would take it uh, in consideration, and they will try to. To, uh, to, to, to develop or to, to de these issues and mm -hmm. to take it in consideration, these issues. And I think that the, when we are talking about uh, religious leaders, the, the duty, the obligation of the religious leaders is to call for the 
benefit the good and to to call to prevent the bad. And 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 this is the mission. This is our mission as leaders is, is to call people to what is on their benefit, on, on on what is good for everyone. And and we I think and I think all of us agree that uh, uh, cases of, of environment cases of, of climate cases of nature it is something which is important for all of us as leaders as as religious leaders so when when we call people to take care of this to, to, to take it in consideration to to be very 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 productive in, in the in the in the any in any debate about it or any any <coughs> actions about it so we need these leaders to, to call the people to that to that to be interesting in that case and to influence then the, the, the political uh, uh, groups and parties. I think that it is very important to have an organic vision and for example the encyclical letter of uh, Pope Francis uh, gives us an organic vision on the issue of uh, ecology. At the same time it is uh, necessary that every uh, one acts on his own level. And so the politicians uh, have to act uh, on a political level. And uh, in the encyclical, uh, there are many uh, suggestions and also uh, critic points. Uh, the religious leader have to work uh, at the uh, level of uh, religious teaching. Uh, but there are many other people in the society, the teachers, not simply the religious teachers, the teachers in the school, in every uh, grade, uh, if they uh, are uh, interested on this issue, they will transmit something. There is the administrative level also, as I said for, uh, with the example of the waste, uh, if the uh, administrative level uh, forces towards some uh, uh, model, people go and go for a good selfish, not for a bad selfish. <laughs> go because they understand that it is better for them. And uh, I think that there is also uh, a kind uh, of uh, a, a, a circle between what uh, it is important uh, to force and what it is important to motivate. So the laws are always in some way forcing, but the laws are in some way also educating. Uh, we are working more on the way of educating and uh, the public should work more in the way of forcing. I agree with what you said but uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that we're using language in very generalized terminology. Uh, religion is not the same thing from one place to the other. It's not the same thing in one context from another and even the same religion can be different in another context for it and its relationship to society differs. So, Rabbi Nero referred to 85% of the world that defines itself in religious terms. That's absolutely true, that's a pure study. But nevertheless, the vast majority of us live in a world where that's not the case at all, because we're part of that 15%. Where very often there's far less religious influence in those societies, and very often many parts of those societies where people don't want to have anything to do with religious leaders, let alone be influenced by them. So, there are parts, however, you refer to Latin America, where unquestionably, even if the, the Catholic Church is facing an onslaught from all kinds of uh, um, uh, evangelical elements now entering into Latin America, it's still the overwhelming dominant social force. There it can play a much more significant role. Many would say it's wonderful that Pope Francis has an encyclical, but he should be perhaps using a little more muscle on some of those clerics to influence governments in Latin America where the Church really can have an impact. And there are some places where religion can use, what's the word in the Israeli court system? Um, moderate physical pressure. <laughs> right. Uh, in other words, in a constructive sense, not to impose, but to 
nevertheless use its influence. And there are other places where religion, in certain parts of Western Europe, though, however, for example, you can see how much Pope Francis is seen as a model by the secular Western society. I mean, he is the ultimate religious superstar of our times. And interestingly, to such a degree that the media and the press totally ignore the realities that they don't like about him and the positions he takes and create their own total narrative, that's another story on its own. <laughs> what it means is that there is still, even within secular societies, a desire to see, a desire to see religion give a positive instruction and, and, and example. And in that, that is an area where, as my colleagues have been saying, where education is important. But I would say informal education is more important than formal education. Formal education is important, but informal education is even more important. And that's where different organizations take actions. A lot of church groups today, uh, and I know of, are taking issues with regards to their investments. And therefore, areas which are involved pollutants and destruction, they have a responsibility to pull out of. I think that's true for all of us. Anybody who's involved in investment should not be investing in areas that are destructive of our environment. And we need to be doing things about that. We also, of course, need to affect our lifestyles. Lifestyles, not least of all in terms of diet. But these things are not likely to have the impact, certainly not fast enough and rapid enough, that government and multinationals have. And that's where religion at least can generate, should generate, the moral high ground and therefore greater awareness. So let's have one last question and maybe we'll keep responses to, to maybe one minute. When, when you talk about the role of religion, um, many of the conflicts that we have are at least at one level of competition over resources. And attempting to be apolitical in a conflict over resources is very difficult. Uh, the, le the letter you mentioned of Orthodox rabbis is, a, is absolutely a political statement against Trump, or at least his position, and on one level. So one, I'd like you to expand on the issue of, pol of politics, and how much you can stay away. Second, I'm sitting here thinking that one example, not very far away, is Gaza. And isn't there a religious imperative to say the people are in this heat that we're all talking about as we sit in an air-conditioned room, all of us, have no air conditioning and no water. Uh, never mind that it's also polluting Israel really because they can't run the um, sewage systems. But right now, as we talk about the you know, third world, the first world difficulties of should we be recycling, and yes, of course we should, um, people are going to be dying very soon of heat stroke and lack of, uh, lack of water. And I'd like your comments on that. I think this is our responsibility to all of us to keep people's life everywhere, every time, in any case. So, uh, so, uh, and and it is in it is in our spirit to keep people's life. And I think this is very very important to mention that the responsibility of the nature it derived from our responsibility to the people. People is above the nature. But, but what do, to do? Uh, our life is derived from the nature. So uh, I think you are, you are right. I think uh, uh, it, is, it, it is, uh, should, should be uh, in the top of the priorities of us, people's life, and then anything who serves the life of the people, which is the, 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 the keeping the nature, keeping the, 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 uh, any actions, any industrial, industrial any, any uh, other actions which influence the climate and influence our, our life. I would like to, to add something to what uh, Shammai uh, asked uh, by Rosen, that we know from the, uh, the uh, stories in the Quran that when Allah was upset of any nation on an, any nation that didn't uh, or did bad in their life, then they, they got a punish from the God. And the punish was by, by the clement, by 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 any uh, uh, by the nature. So so we should live in harmony with the nature because the nature could be our our punishment. I think that it is important that uh, every one of us uh, uh, works on his own level, and so. Uh, when we are uh, addressing this kind of, of issue, 
uh, we are addressing something that uh, it is very important for people, for uh, humanity. And uh, there is no faith without uh, humanity. If we don't care for people, it is impossible that uh, we care for uh, a void uh, nature. And uh, nature and people always are connected uh, in this way, in the way that uh, if we don't care for nature, nature uh, doesn't care for us. And uh, in a religious perspective, uh, this is not only uh, something uh, of interest, but something of value, because we are part of a creation. And uh, at the same time, we think that uh, uh, we are part of a creation that should sing uh, together a praise to God. This is the meaning uh, of uh, Laudato Si, the meaning of uh, uh, be praised to, do, to you, O oh Lord. It means that uh, we are part of this great orchestra and uh, every uh, creature is like an instrument singing together with us uh, uh, his praise, her praise to the Lord. And uh, because of our conscience, uh, we should be those uh, who invite the creation to this uh, uh, cosmic praise. And uh, we should, uh, at the same time, uh, those who take care of all the instruments of this great orchestra. And that, that is the same imagery that Father Patanusas has found in Rav Cook, Rabbi Cook's imagery always talks of these different voices and that the true song is a concert where you are not living in isolation but in harmony with all others, etc. And thank you for your question. I think it's really a very important one. And of course, part of the problem, and the part of, if we look at the history of the terrible record that religion has, I mean, I think religion has brought some of the most wonderful blessings, obviously they are not an objective, but nevertheless anybody who has any kind of perspective cannot but acknowledge that religion is responsible for some of the greatest travesties in human history. And it's responsible for such primarily, of course it's a little simplistic to suggest exclusively, but primarily because of the abuse of power. When religion is married to a power structure, generally it betrays its most noble values. And in some, I would say what's happened to Christianity is that to a large extent it's purified, maybe force majeure, it had no choice, but it's purified itself of its power structures. I would say that the, the bigger challenge for the Muslim world, and to some extent it's a challenge for certain elements within our Jewish society within Israel. And, um, but that's, I believe religion is always healthier when it is not part of a power structure, when it relives in creative tension with a political structure. Does that mean we could anticipate a call, an interreligious call, to all governments right now and all powers to stop using people as pawns specifically? Well, I think we have had some. I think we have some calls like that generally, uh, but more generalized. But when you come specific to the Gaza, I think your point is important. And, uh, there are organizations which also I've been a part, like I'm a founder of Rabbis for Human Rights, which has also taken up those particular issues, etc. These are, these are very important issues, but we have to be open-eyed to recognize we're talking about a humanitarian situation in a very complex political reality, where we're not sing it's not simply an island in isolation, but where a society is seen as controlled, even to some extent democratically controlled, by an element that's seen as an existential threat to Israeli society. Obviously, that's going to create and color and influence the perspective. Unfortunately, even degrading the humanitarian responsibility that we have for that society. So there are also lots of wonderful initiatives in Israel to actually bring ver various resources to people in Gaza and to be able to enable people. And I think that's the most important thing for individuals to be able to be engaged in that. Because I think thinking, uh, that we will be able to influence our governments through simply taking uh, public stands is a little delusory, a little disingenuous. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take public stands because we have to do so for our own moral conscience as well. So I want to thank, uh, thank you, Father Paton, Pastor of the Holy Land, for sharing with us of the Canticle of St. Francis.
reminding us that God created about 10 million species, 8 million of which we haven't even discovered. And at the same time, we're extincting about one species a day. So we have a challenge in our times. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, for sharing with us, uh, including about diet. I'll, I'll note that Rabbi Rosen and his wife a- adhere to and enjoy a vegan diet. And so they have freed themselves from giving power to the meat industry and uh, the, the transportation and uh, factory farming of, of animals. And thank you, Kadi Zahalka, for sharing with us with teachings of the Quran and, and from the Muslim tradition. We see here that this is a counterpoint to what's happening uh, elsewhere in Jerusalem or what has been happening, and that there is a different reality that's possible of people of faith, of religious leaders coming together, remembering that we are, uh, the other is a brother of a different mother, sister of a different mister, and that actually we are uh, all here uh, from, you know, people of faith, uh, and that we can come together to address challenges that, all, that concern all of us. Thank you.